Namaste. Welcome to Smriti. Uh, today we have a wonderful guest, uh, Lakshmi Murthy Garu, with us. Uh, welcome to Smriti, Lakshmi Garu. It is Thank such you. an honor to have you here. Thank you for taking time and uh, bringing your enthusiasm. And you, uh, you have a lot to share today. I cannot wait for that. And uh, so in the series of uh, Smriti Talks, uh, we are uh, recording life journeys, uh, particularly intertwining uh, the Vedic culture, Vedic tradition, Hindu tradition. And uh, here we are, Lakshmi Garu uh, is going to walk down her memory lane and we are going to pick up some insights that we may bring from her life and uh, make a difference in all of us. Very excited, Lakshmi Garu. Welcome. Thank you again. Thank you. Please introduce yourself and uh, we would like to hear from you uh, who you are. Thank you. Uh, hello. Um, I'm very happy to be uh, at your uh, vlog, uh, Smriti. And uh, uh, my full name is Vishwanath Vijay Lakshmi before marriage. After marriage is Vijay Lakshmi Murthy Sikha. Uh, I'm a Vishwanath family from Vishakapatnam. And I married into Sikha family from Amalapuram. And uh, I grew up mostly in New Delhi, even though I was born in Vizag and uh, Bangalore and uh, New Delhi, basically. Um, Hyderabad is our hub, my husband's hub. Uh, basically, I'm a Delhiite, so my mother tongue is Telugu, but my first language is, is Hindi. So I do both equally. Mm -hmm. uh, we got married in 1968. Um, uh, before that, I, I, Delhi University, I finished B Honours Mathematics and uh, MA Mathematics. After that, I wanted to do a PhD in Mathematics at Delhi University, but uh, I got scholarship and I did Bachelor's in Education in a very interesting university called Jamia Millia Islamia uh, in South Delhi. Uh, then after that, I, we got married and uh, we came to the United States. All my life, I've been teaching mathematics, uh, starting from middle school to high school. Uh, because of my mathematics background, uh, usually I would be a home, home teacher for sixth grade or something in my very first uh, school in New Delhi, uh, which is Madrasi Education Ed Society School. And also I, I taught in uh, Nainital uh, in uh, Uttarakhand in this convent, St. Mary's Convent. Uh, by then, I already had my BA, BA, MA in mathematics and math education. But our roots are our roots, what we are inside. But I was so happy to be a homeroom teacher of sixth grade, but I was teaching uh, mathematics from sixth through twelfth grade, all the way, just mathematics. So for the whole school, I was familiar with all the uh, each grade students instead of just one middle school or high school. So my profession is teaching mathematics. Uh, when we came to the United States, we, in 1970, to Salt Lake City, Utah, we both came with admission to do PhD. Uh, my husband was in uh, American literature and I got, had admission in doing mathematics. And uh, it, it's, a, it's a new journey and we did it. Uh, I also liked education and I was very eager to get my jobs and uh, in the Salt Lake City Board of Education uh, School District. Uh, so I did finish my ma master's in education, and uh, that's what I did. I, I transferred my credits and did that part. And uh, I taught in high schools. I taught in uh, community colleges, and I taught at uh, the university level. And uh, even in California, I was in Long Beach City College and Long Beach University, Cerritos College, Cypress College. That was in, uh, in the 90s in uh, Southern California. Then uh, here, uh, in, since 97 in the Bay Area, I taught almost every single college like De Anza College, Foothill College, Kanyara College, mm -hmm. Evergreen College, even down south in Gilroy, uh, Gavlin College. And all that experience landed me full time at the university. And uh, so I retired as a university mathematics teacher. Wow, what an amazing- uh, Yeah, I taught basically, look at me, but I taught finite mathematics. Uh, statistics and uh, geometry, solid geometry, uh, all kinds of difficult subjects. For me, challenging was statistics at Kanyada College. That was very challenging. 
because uh, when I was doing my master's in mathematics, I had an option of doing statistics major or uh, astronomy major. And I signed up for statistics, but because that was the modern thing to do in the 60s. But one of my teachers separated me from a best friend because I was talking to my best friend too much. So she separated us. So my friend was a statistics a major and I became an astronomy major. I did ballistics, uh, and dimensional geometry, all kinds of stuff in my master's degree. But I didn't do statistics, but here I did teach statistics. So when you have a master's, the, the, your employer, the college will take you and they will challenge you to teach every subject that they need you, wherever they need you. So I had so much fun. Uh, now I'm retired. So during the course of my life, even though I worked full time, I was never home. Uh, I never cooked at home, nothing like that. I'm a tomboy. Uh, I lived in hostels uh, and uh, I, I studied. But after marriage, everything comes back to you. As a child, that is my philosophy in life, which my personal experience is. Women, a child may not know that, but they will carry the experiences of their childhood, what the mother teaches, what the father teaches. And um, like my father insisted on me learning a bicycle. And I also drove, rode Vespa and Lambretta scooters. But okay. yeah, and with a sari. Yeah. Uh, then <laughs> when I came here, it's very easy for me to learn driving. So that's why I always drove almost 1,000 miles a weekend uh, from Utah to Los Angeles to teach my daughter Bharatanatyam lessons. So she was in high school, yeah. And there, there are so many phases of my life. So there was a phase of my life where I lived in Utah, I lived in Los Angeles, now I'm living in the Bay Area. But there was a phase of my life where when my daughter was in high school, uh, she, I drove her on a Friday. As soon as she came home from school, uh, 2.30 in the afternoon, we would take off. And at the outskirts of Los uh, Interstate 15 is my road. And uh, we would take a Taco Bell vegetarian taco or something. And uh, by night, we would reach Los Angeles. And uh, early in the morning, 8 o'clock, we were in the dance class for the teacher. It doesn't matter whether you live next door or whether you live two states ahead, you know, wherever. But you show up in the garage where she's teaching. That is how a student will learn. And uh, <laughs> that's what I did. You know, I don't feel like stopping you, but you have so much to say today. Yeah, I just get carried away. So <laughs> we need to put a halter and get back to the uh, format or whatever, you know, we need no, to cover. No, no, no. It's always exciting. I've known you almost, uh, I've seen you from a decade, but I've known you a more closer, which we can say five years or so, but you were always an inspiring personality and uh, not just me I've seen you many people are inspired by you by your activities your enthusiasm and it is amazing and more than all your traditional outlook you have carried all along tirelessly uh, <laughs> something um, uh, I was intrigued and uh, I have uh, spoken with you about it but I felt like you should share this with Smriti viewers also and make an impact on many more people around the world, across the world. And I see yarn behind you. So, I mean, we can go about, I mean, today's topic is integration of your Vedic life, the way you have lived, embracing Vedic culture. Yeah. And uh, a philosophy that you carried in your life. Um, but uh, but your yarn is uh, kind of uh, getting <laughs> Please say something this about the, it, that as well, and yeah, you move on. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. What you see behind me is the end of the road for me. This is what I do nowadays. Uh, okay. This yarn wall has been there since 2017. Uh, yeah. It's a brand new yarn. Uh, these are balls called mandala. Uh -huh. And each ball has different colors in it. And they're very, very nice color. They're called color, uh, color ways, you know. And uh, so you start making something and uh, the colors by come by themselves. They don't uh, really change. You you don't have to change each color a joint. So this is the mandala I make. Okay. Um, it's just a cap caplet. You go uh, goes on the shoulder, okay. and uh, there's so many. So it's just one ball, but it comes as different colors. So I haven't changed anything. And this is called crochet. 
This is not knitting. I'm a professional knitter, master knitter and master crochet. I'm master gardener and master of mathematics. You name it, I have masters in a lot of things. But, but then this yarn is so much fun. I have different kinds of yarn. I mean, in the other room, I have six bookshelves. Here, it's only three bookshelves full of yarn. And I have to collect teacups and, I, I, you know, whatever I do collection. I think my mother's brother used to collect a lot, blown glass and all that stuff. So uh, I take after my mother's side a lot. And I do take after my father also by being bold and by being brave and go for it. You know, Dhairiya Sahase Lakshmi. My father named me Vijay Lakshmi. Oh. And uh, my husband said, that's too long. So he calls me Lakshmi. No, he calls me something else. But uh, when we became citizens, I just became Lakshmi Murthy. So that, yeah. so basically I was born in Rishakhpatna, raised in Bengaluru. My mother used to put two braids on me and always I wore denim uh, skirts and stuff like a convent educated girl. That's how my mother looked at me. Always like that never helped in the kitchen, never did anything. But I do remember uh, my mother um, doing what Lakshmi Pujas, you know, when I was a baby, yeah. kid, five, six, seven, eight years yeah, old. Yeah, I see uh, uh, Amma Varu, we call yeah. in our dialect, and uh, Divine Mother, uh, Lalita. Yeah. Uh, right. yeah. 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 Please share something about it. My passion is, as you can see, the yarn and knitting and crochet and my spiritual, uh, my hobby actually is worshipping Lalita Devi. That is the big uh, photo I have. And I enlarged it and I would take it to the temple and every annual from year 2000 to 2015, every year I was doing Samuhik Lalita Sahastra Namavali chanting for 100 ladies. So I would bring everything and we would chant and give vinyams and everything. So I'm a big devotee of Lalita Devi. This is Navratri time. Nine yes. days we worship Lalita Devi. And every day I, I would just put the lamp and uh, at home I read Lalita Sahasrara Mastotram. But during Navratri, uh, for any goddess, even Lalita Lakshmi, whoever, uh, the minimum you can do is chant 108 names of the Devi. And you know, Harati and Naved, some Navedium every day. Uh, but if you want to go a little bit further, for every god, like a Vishnu or a Lakshmi or a Lalita Devi, uh, we can chant 100, uh, 1000 names and then followed by 108 names. That is the puja parikrama we do. And then all the Shodopacharalu and everything. So that is my Navratri uh, routine. Very nice. And happy Navratri uh, to you and to our Smriti viewers. Yeah. yeah. Particularly, uh, you came to um, our mind, our team's mind, about uh, your outlook, the way you dress up with that big bin <laughs> and yeah. uh, your uh, grand saris, but actually they're very, very pure. They convey a message. And um, yeah. Uh, yeah, like your collection, I've seen you in different <laughs> colors Thank and you. shades Thank you. and your jewelry as well. And yes. uh, I really want to ask you so many questions, like uh, what brought you here and how are you carrying this one? Probably we can start off. Uh, something must have kindled your interest mm. from your early childhood. Uh, so I, I'm curious where, uh, where you are today, what you're following has yeah. a history behind. I want you to go back down your memory lane and start off. Uh, uh, I mean, at what age you felt about this Vedic culture or the Hindu culture that embraced you and made a difference. If you can yeah. remember, please share. Thank you for the question and I'll try to be precise. What are the landmarks that made me change or be what I am today? So yes. as a child, my mother used to do Varlakshmi pujas and we would have, uh, I would watch her do pujas and I also remembered how she uh, put it away at the, after three days of puja. And I also uh -huh. really enjoyed socializing. I, I combine pujas or spiritual experience with socializing. Means at each time you do something, you invite uh, ladies for, at least four ladies for parentum. So I really enjoyed getting dressed and enjoy uh, the ladies coming and, uh, you know, doing the parentums. That, that was 50% of my pleasure following the culture. And then uh, uh, even in New Delhi, we did the same thing. Then uh, I always was fascinated with big party socializing. Means you do puja and, and then you invite everybody, uh, you know, like 50 people and enjoy the socializing part of it. And I love to give out vinyams, you know, you give what one. What is vinyam? 
Uh, vaino means the, uh, goodie yeah, bag. Goodie. Yeah. Goodie so bag. normally vaino means when you invite another lady to see your goddess that you did puja. Amavari, you know, we do we present a, a sari and fruits and everything. Same thing, uh, we give it to uh, the ladies we invite. The minimum you can do is put botu. Minimum four people. Then, uh, uh, in addition to that, you can give tambulam. Tambulam literally means uh, betel nut leaf and vakka and paspu kumkum packets. That's it. And then you can go more and give a fruit, minimum a banana or apple or something. Then if you want more, you can put a blouse piece underneath. Then if you want more, you can put a sari underneath. But basically, that is how you build up. The minimum thing you can do is buttu, and that is why not. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so we are doing in English. I Like I said, I will speak English and Hindi and Telugu all equally. Yes. Yes. So, uh, so that is how my my relationship with socializing as well as uh, our Vedic culture, uh, which is basically for going to temples and then also doing uh, pujas at home. We can we do pujas at home. We also invite pujari to come and perform puja, uh, like big ones. But then uh, yes. normally we we'll attend puja or Mahalakshmi puja or something. Uh, and I always love to go to temples. So my experience was like that at home after marriage. I would do pujas awesome. and invite at least four people uh, mm -hmm. and uh, have fun. Uh, and I had other kinds of parties with our, our, our university, you know, faculty and all that stuff. But coming to, uh, even in Los Angeles, I did Valeshwar Puja with my busy life, working lifestyle. It's very difficult, but you do Friday pujas and then go to work and come back and you do the socializing in the evening. Now coming to Bay Area, same thing. I was working full time. I was working so many jobs. I was a free flower. So career is the most important thing to me. And uh, raising the two children uh, by the book, by the American book, I would say. Um, then, uh, of course, I, the, as culture, I taught my daughter Bharatanat. I, I left no stone unturned. I will not take any uh, pre reason or excuse for not doing something. So oh, I did what you, it's like for you growing a banana tree in, a, in the snow of Alaska, then it becomes precious. Banana trees in, in a village in India, topical, uh, you know, which is very common. But if you grow a banana tree in Alaska, that's very precious. So coming from Utah, where there's no other Indian, and then uh, taking her thousand miles every weekend and teaching her Bharatanatyam, that was the goal of my life. So as a person, when I have, something in my head, I won't rest until it's done. Okay. Whether it's one year or 10 years, it has to be done. And I won't take any excuse for that. Mm -hmm. So now that I finished all my duties in my life, my children are married. Um, even before that, uh, in Bay Area, uh, I moved to Bay Area basically because I love temples and I love, that's my social life. Uh, I also like cultural organizations and participating in cultures, but my mainstay has been uh, Vedic education, learning more. So to, to say that my mother was my inspiration or my mother-in-law was, I didn't see any, I didn't live with mother-in-law that much. Uh, but what I remember, what my mother did was that, I remember. But basically on my own, uh, I would visit temples and I learned it's a self-education, self-taught. So all the procedures. And when I learn something, I go like up to the PhD level. So I fell in love with them, interested in Lalita chanting. And I, I got all my scriptures from Livermu Temple in all the languages. And then I printed them in Kinko's. Uh, it cost me $1,000 to make copies of all those papers in all the languages in year 2000, when I had 100 people in the Sunnyvale Temple to do that. But I distribute them and uh, it's just way of life. I just love it. It's nothing like, oh, I, I'm Orthodox or uh, I have to be spiritual. It's nothing like that. It's just for fun. Um, uh, and so that became a part of my life. So in the Bay Area, a lot of people only know me as this auntie who does Lilith Puja. The, they remember me like that. So I love the, my identity like that. I'm not a math teacher, I'm not whatever, but I am just, um, uh, they don't see me as a professor who is retired. <laughs> that is the only, uh, you know, because they have seen their mothers and mother-in-laws, whoever. Everybody's educated, some are, some are not. But when I come out, 
doing pujas, that's what they think. But, you know, there's a, a stage and age in your life when you do change gears and you, you have to follow your passion. Uh, that is it. Beautiful, beautiful, <laughs> marvelous journey, and it is so uh, exciting. I really like your uh, um, individuality, and but yet you have maintained the thread of it. And yeah, example, and you're setting an example. Not that you're deliberately doing, but you're living your life. But yet you're influencing people around you. Yeah. See, when you're young, uh, when you're working, you wear all kinds of dresses, saris, whatever. Right. At the end, I ended up wearing skirts, you know, to go to mm -hmm. work with the jackets and all. But the only time I wore saris was going to temples. So for me, a temple means patu sari. This is it. Uh, and not printed, Georgette, nothing. Yeah, we get new saris and people wear any saris, but you can wear new saris to go to movies or socializing. But whenever it is a temple, and even when you offer uh, um, a sari to be uh, for the temple goddess, there are certain standards spiritually for Devi what you offer and what Devi can wear. So I always it's buy two. <laughs> that's what I do. So the, with temples, that's how I ended up wearing only patu saris, and that's become a tradition. I love jewelry. Jewelry. I, I don't, I, I can, that's just my trademark. This is how I am. Uh, yeah. About the pujas itself, the process of Vedic uh, awareness and the process of worshipping any god or goddess, the procedure itself, I self-taught myself by observing in the temples, what you do, Sri Suktam, Durga Suktam, you know, all those uh, any, uh, every single thing I learned by printing out papers and learning them by heart. I, I learned by heart Lalita Sastranamam. And then I enjoy chanting Om Angriyam Shriyam Shri Matre Namaha. It, I don't like to, it's not a competition. One thing I noticed is it's not a competition of how much you memorized by heart or how fast can you chant. Uh, to me, performing puja is like yoga or calmness, you know, bring, bring that aura in you, enjoy it. Just like we have a chanting of Om, a chanting of any soft music to calm us down, to lead us through the meditation path. Um, I know it's not uh, that easily accomplishable uh, in the temple setting where there are so many people, but still the process of worshiping itself, there's a procedure to it. And I always watch the priest when they perform it, like for Andal, Goda Devi, I learned Goda Devi, uh, Dhanur Masam, 30 days, I would go and enjoy that. Uh, I know Tamil, so I can chant Tirupavai, not just Venkateta Suprabhatam or, you know. Uh, so I learn anything that's happening. I learn it as I, as I come across it. And the, the mainstay is Lalita Devi, even though I do Mahalakshmi Puja and all that. So the process is you inv invoke uh, you take an idol or even a pasupu, uh, you know, like a Ganesha, yeah, and then you invoke uh, the, the spirit. Uh, to me, is the God is as strong, as big, as huge, as powerful as what we can see in our head. A rock is a rock is a rock. It can be in your shrine, it can, it can be in the mountains, but a rock is just a rock. But if you think that the rock is God, like in India, many, many people say this particular rock under the tree, you know, they make a shrine out of that. So it's just a, how our mind, uh, our test for personal testimony, uh, that is how the spirit evolves out of something. So we invoke uh, the power of goddess in the murti that we worship. And then we do all the upacharas to the Devi Murti by, uh, by chanting Susiktum and, uh, you know, um, like Pancha Amrita, Snanam and everything. And then you do uh, decoration. Then you do uh, 108 names with flowers or Kunkuma or gold flowers or even thousand names like I do in the Navaratri. Uh, and then, uh, uh, then you do Arti, Navajam and everything. At the very end, um, especially in Mahalakshmi Puja, I learned, once you do all of that, then you do Namaskaram. When you do Namaskaram, you, with all that we say, God, I have performed this ritual of praising the Lord in as much as I could. Uh, please forgive me with any mistakes of doing. Please forgive me with any mistakes of pronunciation. Please forgive me in any mistakes I've done in the procedure. And please forgive me if any other thought that I have, uh, you know. And then you, for, you the most humblest, uh, highest per, 
thing for us is to go ahead to God and say, please forgive me. You accept God as the ultimate power that rules the world. And that is how I see it. And then that is one part. The second part is to the goddess, especially when Lakshmi, you say, okay, now I invited you. I did all these things for you. It's like you're giving a gift to somebody. You praise somebody. People are happy, right? And then you say, now that I've been, now I have given you the power. Now uh, you have the power to make me happy. So I'm going to ask you something like, you know, to make me happy or whatever wishes. Yes. And please bestow me those wishes. As then we say, okay, now thank you very much. And then we do the Udvasana the next, especially with Lakshmi, because we want Lakshmi to stay in our sleep in our house. Uh, we, we don't want to make her go away. Uh, Navratri, nine days, we have a procedure. Uh, Galad Ganesha, you know, we do Navratri. So all these things I've learned in the past 20 years. I didn't know there was nine days of uh, Ganesha. Uh, and I didn't know much about Kartika Masam. Like right now, this... Um, Navratri, then comes Diwali. Everybody knows about Deepavali. But right after Deepavali Amavasya starts Kartika Masam. When they start Kartika Masam, there's a Rudram, you know, the Lord Shiva is worship 30 days, which I didn't know that. I only thought Shivaratri was for Lord Shiva. But now here I learned a lot how you do it, how, uh, you know, there's no end to spirituality. Uh, there are two, one is visible and one is invisible, spirituality. Uh, so yes. that's in our mind and how much we want to. Mm -hmm. And the another thing is we, if we to have control on our body, it would be nice to go to a temple on a routine basis and uh, worship God, whatever is happening. Another thing uh, I would say, normal routine. It is a blessing just to be normal. Imagine when you have a pain or when you uh, had to do something and you didn't have time to do it. So just to do your normal, be a normal thing, normal that is the state of affairs. We don't want up and down this way, that way. So being normal means doing yoga, doing your daily chores, doing, you know, balance your day 24 hours. That if, if life goes on a train tracks like that, that is the best thing you can accomplish in your life. You don't want surprises. You don't want ups and downs. Very well said. What a marvelous uh, journey. It is very exciting. I mean, I could travel with you and uh, it really feels so good the way you explained uh, to lead a life, conduct our life. And uh, so uh, another basic question is, uh, uh, what does uh, all of this mean to you, uh, the Vedic, and what message do you want to give away to your uh, younger generation? Uh, I mean, because I saw uh, you already mentioned that uh, it is a responsible way of living your, our lives. And uh, mm -hmm. please give away some message to your uh, younger generation, people to follow. Because yes. you have lived in the U.S. for 50 years. Yes. Yet you are embracing our Indianness, the Vedic culture, the Hindu culture. And uh, uh, so what is it that you want to relay for younger yeah, 50 years in the United States. Uh, uh, coming from India and living in India in different parts of the country like uh, South India and New Delhi and coming to the United States for actually mm -hmm. educational purposes. From the beginning, I had my heart set. I want to go to America. A lot of people will, will say, oh, we're just going to go to education. We're going to come back to India, which is in those days, it was not that. People were always um, uh, dreaming of coming to the United States and living here. So. I came that way, but as students, we had to work out, work hard, I get, get our degrees and get our jobs straightened out and then green card and then become a citizen. Uh, and that's the process. And then settle down. Once you settle down, do, during that, you, 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 I carried my pujas or whatever festivals, Indian festivals, uh, basically with the India associations and things like that. Uh, then uh, I have a mixture culture of uh, North Indian and South Indian in me. Uh, but basically we need to trust ourselves, uh, our parents and our upbringing. So as a child, we may not even think we're listening to our parents. Uh, but in those days, you know, I'm, uh, you know, 
So 50 years in the United States, there was no Indian culture. There was no other Indian where we lived, basically just a few people in the university. Uh, on a personal level, there was nobody, no matter. And by the time it grew, we went to another town where I was the only Indian for 20 years. So I had to do my own thing keep my career as well as raise the children, uh, doing Raksha Bandhan for brother and sister or some pujas like that. Um, so for the new generation, including my own children, I think the basic thing is a child remembers their childhood. The mother and the father are the most influential by leaving the example example. They may not be very uh, orthodox uh, religious people, but whatever values you inhibit, uh, you relive, that's what the children will learn. And that they are, that are the grassroots. Uh, all you have to do is do the best and give them the wings to fly. And then they will know where, like a bird, where, they will know where the house is. The bird flies around, but in the, in the evening, it flies back to the tree where the house is. Like that, the children have inside of them. Uh, that is, I truly believe that. And that is a trust and the freedom you give it to the child, the wisdom to choose. Uh, it's like the serenity prayer, you know. God, give me the uh, strength to you know, do what I want. Give me the, uh, you know, the, in the very end it says, give me the strength to know the difference. Things you can change, things you cannot change, things you can accept. But then you need to know the difference, uh, whether you need to push it for change or you need to accept it. That is the wisdom we should have. That is the wisdom a child should have. Whether they go to college, they, go, they become a doctor, they're working, they meet so many people, but, uh, but then it comes back to their heart, you know. So that is what I want to tell the new generation. Don't get lost, just stick to your roots. The parents will give you the wings to fly. You fly, achieve your best, enjoy life, but then you also don't forget your roots. That's what I would let's say. So that also brings about uh, the philosophy also. How do you embrace uh, yeah. what you want yeah. to do and uh, to what extent um, that brings you that calm. You really use the beautiful, uh, the serenity, the sereneness is so important in everybody to really live life fully. Yeah. yeah beautiful and uh, but what does all this uh, you you have you have a certain form the way you carry the actions the pujas and everything what does it all mean to you at the end of the day if you go back vedic culture hindu culture i mean i mean how do you go back to bed every time i mean what does it mean to you you know life is a process of learning and growing and getting wiser or at least learn with your personal experiences on a daily basis, yearly basis. Every day is a different day. Every month is a different month. Every year, suddenly five years go by and you'll know, oh, I was like this five years ago. I'm like this today. So you can really see the difference. So the main thing is, um, it's kind of hard some, sometimes, uh, you know, physically, health-wise, emotionally. Uh, everybody has to go through that. But it all's well that ends well. That means you should have the courage and build the confidence and strength inside of you. Uh, be a road uh, for that healing would be going to the temple or worshiping or yoga or for me, my knitting. If nothing happens, if I don't feel like doing something, I'll just sit and start knitting. Uh, if somebody is learning dancing or music, uh, they can start singing or they can start dancing. And whatever it takes, but we cannot cross the limits, but within our limits, we learn, we need to learn to fix whatever is going on. You are the person who knows yourself. You are the doctor for yourself. You are the healer for yourself. But your people are very realistic. They, that is the main thing I carry from this 2020 is being realistic. Very nice. And uh, so uh, what would you like to see uh, in your absence later on? What kind of tradition would you like, uh, would you envision that one should carry still? <laughs> if I may ask you that question, yeah. what would you like, like to see it flowing in the Vedic side particularly? Uh, yeah, um, right now at this stage, especially after I retired, I have all the time. I spend time uh, worship, going to temples, 
and worshiping, following our, our culture. Uh, like I say again and again, I'm not a fanatic. I'm not a deep down, but I know the whole thing. I know the process, but I also combine our spirituality with socializing. We need to, we cannot be in a cocoon like a Maharishi and say, I'm going to sit in the jungle under the tree and do my yoga or whatever. There are people who have been enlightened like that, but I don't consider myself like that. I'm just doing my job. Uh, whatever I'm able to do. You need to build a society around you. It's like a net, a web, and you need to act that you pick. And then you need to act responsibly to each person that you have built as a, your network. So that gives you a protection of network. And that also gives you challenge to be a role model, to live your, you know, what's your life, what's your life, and be a role model to other people. So that's how I see it. I have one question here. So uh, what have you seen? You go to uh, temples frequently and uh, uh, what would you like uh, see continuing in temples or in the Vedic wisdom wise? Um, uh, what do you want to see after even after you leave? Uh, like what do you want to kind of uh, wish people do what they're doing and it uh, has to be kept? Yeah, I'm you talking know, about the body of knowledge here. Yeah, um, you know, I like I say, dharma. Mm -hmm. First of all, it is our dharma, means our duty right. to follow the dharma we are born into and right. to fo follow and adapt and understand as much as we can and right. also follow as much as we can uh, in as much as it can be done with other responsibilities of uh, around our life right. and our yeah. family yeah. and our health as well uh, yeah. right now i don't even see the, the, the temples are there they're shrines that's where we look physically look at god and worship so the temples should be there we support the temples, uh, whatever the religion or temple you believe in, that is the anchor for you to look up to. And you support it. Without your support, nothing can exist. As a devotee, you can do that. And, and, and personally, uh, the legacy, uh, if I may say something like this, well, yesterday I was telling somebody, you know, I, I was not feeling well today, I couldn't go to the temple. And then they go, uh, Lakshmi Garu, you know, you've done so many pujas, you've done so much in your life. Today, if you didn't go, that is okay. You've done enough. You have, but I'm not doing enough to acquire punyam. I'm not doing daily, as long as we are living on a daily basis, we have to do, deal with our karma and we have to follow our dharma. Those are the two words, I would yes. say. Very, very nice. What an exciting uh, um, uh, time I've had listening to you. And I'm sure our Smriti view viewers have picked up many insights how to live, live joyfully and be happy what you're doing. And yeah. you are an example for that. And I really, really appreciate to be in association with you. Yeah. Uh, I have been blessed and I'm sure many people watching you are going to be inspired and okay. have made a difference. I want yes. to give you a final statement, in a, not in one sentence, but thank you, thank you yes. for inviting me to Smriti. And I really feel an honor and I really think I do deserve to be talk, talking and let people see what I think about. I appreciate you giving me this opportunity, number one. Number two is uh, the, like you say, the dharma, karma, whatever, but the virtual worship, like yesterday, the temple is doing virtually with the camera. So yes. I am home, but I'm still worshiping. I'm looking at something. So watching the temple, watching the deity is an anchor for us, for physical, physical concentration. But we can close our eyes and we can still concentrate and worship and pray. Uh, so that is what I would... Uh, for me, the temple is forever there because even if I cannot go to the temple, uh, I can stay at home and as long as the technology and the electricity is working, we can, this is a new step, new step for retired people who cannot go physically go to the temple. Uh, this is a beautiful, so much technology to enjoy everything from where you are. And, and also I wanted to tell you that I am not very orthodox, I'm not very religious, but uh, like I say, religion and social, socializing is a 
is a thing for me, a norm for me. Uh, like I said, I enjoy giving uh, these goodie bags to 100 people at a time, not one or two, 100. And that is how I do it. I love tea parties and I, I have done that, you know, uh, last year I did a tea party. And so it is, it's what you like, happiness, what you like, do what you like, knitting, dancing, uh, throwing tea parties, going to temples, going, and, and also we all our culture we bring into ourselves, uh, we reflect that into our children's weddings and children's celebrations, uh, birth of grandchildren, you know, we grow with the family. Um, but at the same time, uh, for me, I'm able to keep my identity, my independence, and uh, I, I'm a role model to everybody. In the, that's what they say. But for me, many times, you know, th life throws things at you that you need to uh, survive. And I, tr I truly believe God gives you a challenge uh, regardless. And you get the strength to survive. I, there's nothing like throwing up the towel. I can't deal with it. I don't believe in saying I cannot deal with it. You can deal with it the amount to the extent that you can. And God has given you that power. So for the younger generation, just do your thing and, and be true to yourself. Follow your intuition, follow your duty, follow your, follow your vision in life. Very beautiful. Thank you so much. And, but what we, I could pick up is you have anchored in the Vedic culture and that yes. also made you a person here and then really live your life fully. And, uh, yeah, talking about this auspicious Navratri times with the Hindu religion, this, this is the most precious nine days of worship of yes. goddess yeah. uh, in Durga, uh, nine forms of the goddess, nine powers of the woman. We are women. We talk about women's empowerment and all that stuff. Right. But for me, the Vedic education, Vedic dharma, following our Vedic spiritual, uh, you know, uh, spiritual, the books and everything, uh, that is what is important. And this time uh, you're interviewing people during this Navratri time, it's a very apt time for me as a woman, for me as an embodiment of power, a Shakti, and a devotee of Goddess Durga, Goddess Lalita Devi, nine forms of the goddess and the Devi and woman's powers. We're celebrating the power of woman and happy times. Beautiful. I'm speechless for now. And what an amazing time well spent with you. And uh, uh, please continue what you're doing. You are an inspiration. And, uh, thank you. Uh, uh, so thank you, uh, Smriti viewers. Uh, was, thank you. Uh, <laughs> Lakshmi Murti Garu. Uh, she really shared uh, beautiful. Uh, she walked her journey, but there were insights for us all to pick up. Uh, please stay tuned with Smriti. Uh, there, are, uh, there is a wealth of information at our Smriti repository. The curation is happening at smriti.upasana.net. We have a YouTube channel, Upasana. Please follow, share, and um, support Smriti Project. Uh, we are all in this together. We want to preserve our culture, wisdom, the body of knowledge, and it is a responsibility on all of us to take it forward, keep it with us, and keep it alive forever. Uh, thank you, Lakshmi Garu, once again. Thank you. Thank you. It's been a pleasure being in Smriti. And I hope I added something to your collection of interviews and my, my knowledge and my, my you know, Vedic uh, in, insight to you for your topic. Thank you. Absolutely. You did. Thank you again. Namaste. Okay, everybody. Namaste. Namaste.